Um, so forms of asexual reproduction. Uh, in eukaryotic cells, there's budding, vegetative reproduction, and fragmentation. So you can see the differences here. So I'm going to show you some pictures. So that's budding. So this is a hydra, right? That's what the, um, uh, the organization in Marvel Comics is named after, right? When you cut the head off one hydra, then another one, uh, another one um, arises, right? So you can never really kill it. So this is a hydra plant, and this is what happens. So um, with budding, the actual hydra plant clones itself, and a, and a little hydra plant grows out of it. And it's a complete clone. So it's like if a little you grew out of you. That would be weird. Um, that's what happens in hydro plants. Um, in vegetative reproduction, there's two types of reproductive um, parts. There's the roots, um, which uh, the roots here um, generally come from male or female plants. And the shoots are clones that come off the male or female parent and the shoot can develop into a new tree or plant. Okay, so plants have gametes, um, so they can reproduce sexually, and they can propagate those gametes over wind, which is why they're tall, because they can't move. Um, and when a male and female gamete that comes from pollen, right, um, uh, fertilizes another gamete, then that can make a parental plant, and then clones can come off of that. All right, so the immobility, so plants have uh, some ingenious ways to deal with immobility. This is fragmentation. This is kind of freaky. So this is a flatworm. So remember that worms are, are segmented. Right, so they have, so they have different, uh, so annelids, uh, or annelida, that's the uh, genus. Um, annelida has separate parts. So all these worms have different segments. So, this, so some of these flatworms and uh, other types of worms, they have like little brains and hearts in each segment. And some of these segmented worms actually have stem cells in each segment. So if I were to cut up a, like a, a platy helminth worm, so I could find these flatworms in Big Hill Creek. Um, so if I were to cut it up into three pieces, those pieces would grow into new worms. Right, so if I cut you in half and you grew into two U's, that would be how that work. How that would work. That is super freaky. All right, that is an asexual strategy for eukaryotic cells as well. But the most interesting type of um, uh, asexual reproduction in eukaryotic organisms is parthenogenesis. So you need to know this one well. So asexual reproduction is rare in animals, um, but these are skinks. Um, this also happens in Komodo dragons. We've observed it in nurse sharks. We've seen it in rhesus monkeys. Um, we've seen it in lots, uh, quite a few different types of uh, complex animals. Okay. So in parthenogenesis, um, when no males are present, and this happens with Komodo dragons a lot because there's not a lot of them. They live in, um, they live, you know, in a series of islands. In Indonesia, all right, um, a couple hundred islands called the islands of Komodo. So there's often really large spaces between the animals. So if no males are present, then the females, what they can do is they can use a polar body to fertilize the egg that they've produced. And because crossing over occurs in meiosis, they can produce genetically distinct female offspring. So the offspring are always female, um, but no male is necessary. So it's a bit tough in mammals because we have imprinted genes. So you have to have a gene that um, it comes from a male and comes from a female to ensure sexual reproduction. It's kind of like a fail-safe um, uh, mechanism that evolution has given us to make sure sexual reproduction occurs. Um, Insulin-like growth factor, or IGF, is a good example of an imprinted gene where you have to have a copy of a male's IGF and a copy of a female's IGF in order to produce viable offspring. If we were in class, I'd go into more detail on that, but I'm not going to here. Um, so the offspring are always female with parthenogenesis. Okay, um, here is an article about that. So this is an article about Komodo dragons. 
and they they don't need dudes and in fact some of these females actually use males as as prey so that's a little cutthroat but um, there was so if you remember the first Jurassic Park all the way in 19, from 1993 um, the raptors reproduce they're all females and they reproduce through parthenogenesis because they had um, uh, amphibian gene spliced into their genome in order to fill some of those genetic patterns and there are some unintended consequences that is obviously a very Hollywoodized um, version of this type of science, but that's the general idea. Anyway, it shows that males are accessory to many species. There's lots of weird um, sexual strat dimorphic strategies um, in the animal kingdom. Uh, one is, uh, a good one is groupers. Um, so they live in mangrove forests in the Caribbean. Uh, there's, well, there's species of groupers all over the world. Um, all groupers are born male. They live about 100 to 150 years. All of them undergo sex changes in middle age and become female. So it's these old females that used to be males that reproduce with the younger males. So think about that, all right? Um, so there's lots of novel strategies for these organisms to deal with reproduction. Anyway, you can Google a whole bunch of them. Uh, clownfish is another good one. I, I'm not going to tell you what happens with clownfish. I think I might have already shared this with a few of you. But look up the sexual history of clownfish and you'll never look at Finding Nemo again the same. All right, I'm almost done here. So those are how animals work. Um, plants, like I said, uh, they have vegetative reproduction. Um, but there's also they also do this... Um, Plants and other immobile types of organisms. So planktonic organisms, so organisms that exist uh, suspended in the ocean and the ocean currents guide their motion so they can't move on their own, uh, to the, on their own devices. Um, but alternation of generations is what I'm going to talk about here. And on your textbook, it's page 575 to 579. So with organisms that undergo alternation of generations, they have uh, gametes and they have spores. And there's actually um, a body form that is haploid and a body form that is diploid. So they have different body structures to deal with immobility. Um, so it'd be kind of like if, you know, your sperm left your body, grew legs, walked around for a little bit, and, or an egg did the same thing. And, uh, and then fertilized and turned into a new person. No one wants that, right? Our world would be completely bombarded with sperm. So, um, so we don't do that, right? Um, but they may be haploid or diploid, right? Um, so these body forms. This is called alternation of generations. And with immobile organisms, it allows for long distance propagation of offspring. So life cycles of plants consist of two generations, one's haploid and one diploid. The diploid generation is called the sporophyte and the haploid generation is called the gametophyte. Okay, um, so page 576, and McGraw-Hill shows this. This is figure 16.25, so take a look at that. Sporophyte and haploid gametophyte. You need to know where meiosis, fertilization, and mitosis occur. Um, there's another one here with ferns and moss. Page 577, but this happens in more than plants. Like I said, it happens in planktonic organisms too. Jellyfish, sea urchins, sea anemones, um, sea cucumbers, stuff like that. Their um, uh, larval stage is all suspended um, in the water column in the ocean, and so they're planktonic. All right, so this is figure 16.28. There is an haploid and a diploid life form. So here's the gist of what happens with alternation of generations. Okay, I'm gonna give you, I'm gonna show these diagrams here really quickly. 
So in plants, here's a gametophyte. So these are, this is a, uh, sorry, this is a big sporophyte, diploid organism. Um, in trees, the gametophyte is microscopic and it propagates on pollen. Um, big, so vascular plants, so things that have xylem and phloem, the sporophyte will be large. In, in uh, plants that don't have xylem and phloem, um, the gametophyte is the main organism, right? So there's no, the, nothing can carry nutrients and water against gravity with um, non-vascular plants. So the gametophyte is really small. So mats of moss or lichens and stuff like that, they'll spread out across the, um, spread across the bottom of a forest. And the sporophyte, so this is sphagnum moss. This sporophyte will be these little propagations up top. Right, so plants that have vascular tissue, the sporophyte is dominant. And the dominant generation in non-vascular plants is a gametophyte. Okay. So alternation of generations is mostly, I, I wouldn't say, I should probably reword that. And it's not strictly a plant term, it's mostly a plant term. Um, plants and planktonic organisms. So these could be invertebrates and or algae in the ocean. And some animals will switch between asexual and sexual stages, right? Okay, so that's the last slide for this section of the unit. Um, but alternation of generations generally looks like this. And I'm going to show you an example in your key. Okay, so you're going to have a diploid sporophyte. Okay. And this, you'll have a male and female sporophytes. So they're going to produce... Um, Haploid gametes, so these are gametes, okay, but rather than fertilization occurring, so this is, this is produced by meiosis, but rather than them fertilizing right away, what happens is, is these produce gametophytes. So you'll have the gametes turn into a, their own organism for a period of time. Sorry, I should reword this. Sporophytes produce spores. And they're haploid. Okay, so these spores are produced by Meiosis from the sporophyte, and this produces the gametophytes. And these are also haploid, but they're tissue. They're their own organism. And then the gametophytes produce gametes. And that is, so what happens here is the spores turn into the gametophyte, and that's mitosis. And remember that... <coughs> Gametes are also haploid, so the ploidy doesn't change. All right, so we go from 2N to N here, that's meiosis. N to bigger N organisms here, that's mitosis. And then we go from N to N again. And that's weird, but that's actually mitosis. So gametes are produced by mitosis in alternation of generations. Then what happens is, is when conditions are good, gametes are produced by the gametophyte. Fertilization will occur. And we'll make a diploid sporophyte, right? And it'll turn into an adult sporophyte. So you have the sporophyte producing spores. The spores turn into gametophytes. The gametophytes make gametes. The gametes fertilize each other to make a new sporophyte. So you have a haploid body structure. And you have a diploid 
body structure and this would be like a big tree. All right, so there's an extra stage in there from what happens with us or other complex organisms like animals. So I'm gonna go in your key, I'm almost done here. So there are many questions in your key. I've addressed most of the major ones. There are many questions in your key that address this first section of the unit. Again, I told you to look at Ploidy the other day and look at this diagram. But I want to give you an alternation of generations question. If I can find it. Uh, page 96. Um, so this is asking about question number 16. Okay, so what you need to do here, um, so this is green algae. Right, sporophytes make spores. Uh, you can, you'll see them called zoospores. Anyway, sporophyte, here's what you need to do is label the ploides of all these things. So there's the sporophyte will produce spores and the spores are haploid, so that's produced by meiosis. The sporophyte is diploid, right? The spores are haploid and the gametophytes produce are produced from the spores. So the gametophytes are also haploid, so you should label that. And the gametes that come from the gametophytes are also haploid. So the process that makes the gametes in alternation of generations is actually mitos mitosis because the ploidy doesn't change. So N plus N gametes comes together to make zygote, that's fertilization. Okay. So 16 asks, which structures in the life cycle of the ulva are haploid? So the zygote is not haploid, the spores are. The sporophyte and the zygote are both diploid. So zoospores and gametophytes are both haploid. So C would be your answer to that. Okay, so make sure you look at this diagram and look at the examples in your textbook for that. Okay, so those are reproductive strategies. That is the end of section one um, of uh, this genetics unit. The next section is Mendelian genetics. I'm going to wait a couple days till I start talking about Punnett squares and all that stuff. Um, you have mitosis, meiosis quizzes, and you have a, a comic strip with meiosis to make. Um, you're also, you also have a unit test with um, mitosis, meiosis, asexual and sexual reproductive strategies that you can now do. Um, that is in your content section. That unit test has a picture of Wolverine at the, at the, uh, on the top of it because we were talking about uh, him as an example of really good my, mitosis. Um, anyway, I'm going to leave it there. I'm going to post this lecture once I've got it copied. Any questions, please let me know.